Today's Dracula provided some of the most memorable voices in children's entertainment and is one of two Skeletors in the list. New York City native Alan Lewis Oppenheimer was born in 1930. While attending university at Carnegie Tech, Oppenheimer worked at KDKA Pittsburgh, where he honed his voice work on the weekly radio show Adventures in Research. He would play a different scientist every week in fictionalized accounts. Hello! Anybody home in this apothecary shop? Yeah? What's that? Who is that? Good morning, Uncle Carl. Huh? Oh, it's you out now. Why must you shout like that? Frighten me, so I very nearly dropped my best mixing water. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Uncle Carl. I guess I'm just a little over-elated this morning. <laughs> over-elated. He graduated from Carnegie in 1952 and worked at the Arena Stage Theater in D.C., where he frequently appeared on stage alongside René Auberjonois. Oppenheimer would make his first uncredited appearance on television in a 1963 episode of The Untouchables, in which he played a morgue attendant. But he would rise rapidly as a character actor throughout the 60s, appearing in such programs as I Spy, Get Smart, and Hogan's Heroes. He would continue to expand his character work in the 1970s, but he also picked up a lot of work in animation, particularly for filmation. The booming Saturday morning market needed voices, and Alan Oppenheimer had one of the best, infinitely flexible and dependable. If you were a child anywhere from the late 60s through the mid-90s, there's a very good chance that Oppenheimer's voice is lodged in your brain in one role or another. For that matter, if you've played video games in the 2000s, he's probably there too, since he's provided voices for franchises like Fallout, Baldur's Gate, God of War, but his most popular role is probably the one that he still gets asked about today whenever he makes a public appearance. Skeletor from the original He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. Most recently, he can be heard in Kevin Smith's reboot of Masters of the Universe for Netflix, where Oppenheimer appears as Moss Man. It's us, Big D, the Brat Pack. Don't call me Big D. I am your great uncle Dracula. Now, the whole world is waiting to see if Ogre succeeds in getting into the grimmest book of record. What have you done to stop Dr. Dredd? From very early in television's history, Saturday mornings were for children, but it didn't make a lot of sense in the early days to create original cartoons, because animation was complex and expensive. The boom in popularity of limited animation changed that in the 1960s. That process, animating only the pieces of a character that needed to move instead of drawing the entire figure cell by cell, had actually been pioneered in the 1940s, with Warner Brothers' The Dover Boys often being credited as one of the first limited animation shorts. The process would first appear in color on television in 1957's Colonel Bleep as part of Uncle Bill's TV Club, but it was Hanna-Barbera that would explode the use of limited animation to provide original cartoons for television. This would lead to other studios dedicated to producing original children's cartoons cheaply and quickly, including Filmation, the Patty Freeling Enterprises, and J. Ward Productions, makers of Rocky and Bullwinkle. By the 1970s, television networks were clamoring for original animation for their Saturday morning lineups and the demand would only increase throughout the 1980s. Generally speaking, the Saturday morning block was around five hours long on each of the major networks. With most programs running around 30 minutes long, that's a lot of content needed, and Hanna-Barbera and its followers were more than happy to pump out product. Hanna-Barbera in particular mastered repackaging, producing content at a high speed with little concern for whether or not it was successful in the long term because their marketing department would be able 
to repackage and sell the same shows for further blocks of Saturday mornings a few years later by combining them with newer programs for larger blocks. This led to a sort of throw-it-at-the-wall-and-see-what-sticks mentality, and out of that comes the Drac Pack. Dig it, friends. The monsters of yesteryear had kids, and those kids had kids, and so on. Their descendants are now able to look human, but can change into their monster selves whenever they need to use their powers through an ancient ritual known as the Drakwak. Yes, I know what that sounds like. Three young hip monsters, Drak Jr., Frankie, and Howler, want to atone for their ancestors' wrongdoings. So they set out in their amphibious flying car, the Drakster, to fight the forces of Ogre, the Organization for Generally Rotten Endeavors. But the gang doesn't have to fight them alone. Assisting them, or commanding them, the relationship isn't quite clear, is the president of the Transylvania Retired Spooks, Specters, and Spirits Society, Drac Jr.'s great-uncle Dracula himself. As befits a father figure for swingin' 60s teenage superheroes, Count Dracula is referred to by the nickname Big D. Big D. Dracwack. All right, gang, let's whack. He's called Big D. He doesn't like being called Big D, but that's what he's called. Uh, Big D, uh, sir, are you there? I'm coming! I'm coming! Hey! It's Little D! Very funny! What the dread does to me, this! And you make with the jokes! As Big D, Alan Oppenheimer spits out his best Bella Lugosi comedy impersonation. Let's face it, animation needed to be done quick and cheap, and leaning on iconic voices was the way to go. Jerry Dexter was doing his best Maxwell Smart imitation as Drac Jr., and Julie McWhorter's Vampira sounds an awful lot like Ava Gabor. It was a trope of the time, and it worked very well for Hanna-Barbera. What's great about Oppenheimer's Dracula, however, is that he is just such a stuffy old man when it comes to the kids. Sure, he's there to help, and he doesn't mind that their whole bag seems to be undoing the things he spent his unnaturally long life doing in the first place. But that doesn't mean that they have to call him Big D now, does it? Let's maintain a little bit of dignity. Over the course of the Drac Pack 16 episodes, Dracula primarily appears over the video phone. He is, after all, a very busy man, and the kids are supposed to have all of the hard labor covered anyway. Besides, all the best leaders communicate from a distance. Charlie, Colonel K, Basil Exposition. Why should Big D be any different? The Drac Pack may not have been a huge success when it debuted in 1980, but it has become something of a cult classic in the time since. With its Monsters Become Heroes core concept, it was just such a perfect example of the animate first and ask questions later school of thinking that was fueled by tons of money from the people selling sugared cereals. Yes, that's what it was fueled by. We're just about due for a brand new take on the show, and if I have to be the person that HBO Max signs to make it happen, then I guess that's just a sacrifice I'll have to make. With a career as varied and legendary as Oppenheimer's, you would probably imagine there are a lot of awards attached to his name, or at least a lot of nominations. But in fact, Alan Oppenheimer has only been nominated for two major industry awards. A primetime Emmy for a guest appearance on Murphy Brown in 1991, and a Behind the Voice Actors Award as part of the cast of Kid Icarus Uprising. Alan Oppenheimer married award-winning theater costume designer Marianna Elliott in 1958, and they had three children. Alan Oppenheimer still enjoys making public appearances and speaking with fans of his long and prolific voice acting career. By all accounts, Alan Oppenheimer is a true mensch and loves his fans. So what do you think of Alan Oppenheimer as Big D? Don't call him Big D, he's Dracula. Yes, Big D, what exactly do you think of Alan Oppenheimer's Big D? Drop into the comments and let me know. What do you think of the Drac Pack? Is this a fond memory from your childhood? Did you discover it recently? Are you just now learning that such a thing existed? 
While you're down in the comments, make certain to hit all those buttons. There's like and subscribe, and there's a bell that will notify you whenever there are new videos. There's also a share button that you can use to share this video with anybody you think might enjoy it because sharing is caring. Yep. Right on time. The white gloves are always there right on time. Until next time, I am Glenn Williams, the film optimist, reminding you to watch like it means something.